I'm Dick Miller, and uh, next to me is my good friend, Senator Jeff Smith. And uh, we haven't seen Jeff for about a month. I guess we missed a month. Yeah, I think we did. And I think uh, at that time, you were engaged seriously in uh, budget work. And uh, uh, that's, I think, the topic of discussion primarily today, though, as you mentioned earlier, that you've, you kind of like to vacation a little bit from that <laughs> discussion. Yeah, well, we'll do one more talk about budget, maybe depending on what happens in the future. But <laughs> yeah, it's uh, um, that has to be a very uh, demanding area. I and I think uh, when it's more balanced, it's probably a uh, more of a joint effort in in writing a budget. Yeah, it certainly would be. Yeah, so uh, maybe in the future, we'll see if we get different maps and uh, less gerrymandered uh, state mm -hmm. and um, and I don't want to dwell on that we talked about that a lot but there's a whole generation of legislators from what I, my observation who don't know any other way mm -hmm. and it's going to be like culture shock if they actually have to learn how to work together yeah well it's relearning what people used to do, do yeah. just sit down and talk back and forth and yeah. come to you know, sometimes come to maybe compromises that are better than just what the, the individual parties. I sure look forward to it. And then we wouldn't have these uh, panics that we're hearing, seeing right now in the, in the newspapers or on Twitter or whatever, um, the Republicans are so angry about the vetoes that the governor mm -hmm. um, used this week. Well, and I think we'll, maybe we'll touch on that a few, in just a few minutes. Um, we know the governor did submit a budget and to the best of my knowledge, it seems like uh, it was pretty much dead on arrival. Is that fair to say that the, the, the Republican Party basically uh, set it aside and, and put yeah. together the, the, a budget that was more in, in their liking? So that's to speak. right. And I think that that's a good place to start because that's where it all starts. So the governor presenting his version of a budget and for the third, he's, this is, was his third attempt at a budget and for the third budget in a row, the Republicans trashed it completely, disregarded it, and decided to do it on their own. And that's, I think, what also ties to what we said mm -hmm. earlier a minute ago, that um, they don't know how to work together. And, and uh, it's their way or the highway kind of thinking, and we got to get away from that. Yeah, I th it's, it would, in my estimation, you'd have a better budget if people would be able to work together, the governor's office and, and the legislature. Yeah, there wouldn't um, be a need for some of these line item vetoes, you know, if we if we yeah. worked it out ahead of time. Well, now uh, the governor has signed the budget, I understand. And uh, um, the line item, uh, but uh, line item veto, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, sounds like I have my lunch in my mouth yet here today. Um, can you explain maybe what the line item, uh, line item veto is and how it came into existence? Do you have any history in that? Well, a little bit, and I know that it was a, it was something that was um, added to our constitution in 1930, as a matter mm. of fact. So it's that old. I mean, I, even my wife just said, "Did this just start like 10 years ago?" No, this is a, this is a long history of, of line item veto, and so originally even you could do things like, just I line out letters or one word to reconstruct a sentence. And that was up until 2008 when I was in the state legislature then. And, and we um, ran through the, and changed with the constitutional amendment that that mm -hmm. was not something they could do. They called that the um, Banna White um, or Frankenstein vetoes where oh. you could really reconstruct um, words and, and, uh, and sentences. Can't do that anymore but he can still um, line item out numbers. And, and as in this case, what he did with the, with the um, $325 student or child per child uh, funding for schools, he lined item numbers and mm -hmm. a hyphen and created a whole new number. Um, and that is not also the first time that's happened um, so this particular one, I'm sure you would have asked about it anyway, and it's taken a lot, getting a, a lot of the attention. Mm -hmm. Is he? Um, it was 
a $325 per pupil increase that Republicans put in the budget for the next two years. So it said the 2024 to 2025 school year, or, or 2024-25 school year. Mm -hmm. He took out the 20 and the dash. Let me see, so it says, so now it says 2024, to, yeah, 2024 to tw the year 20, or no, 2,425. So, <laughs> That's, that ends up being a 402 year um, line, by, uh, line uh, item. And, and it's, it's misunderstood because of the rhetoric that's going out there. It means that school districts have the option to increase their school funding by $325 per student in the first place. So, and also it won't remain 400 years, I'm sure, because a future legislature or governor mm -hmm. will create something else and, and, and uh, change that. But it's, it left him with no option when, he, when he's been asking for a um, increase to, to, uh, stick, to stay with inflationary increases. Mm -hmm. He's been asking for that for as long as he's been governor and beyond and the Republicans have refused. So this was the closest thing he could get. Now this would be uh, a yearly increase from the state? So that's the other thing. It is, it's, they can increase the funding, right? So if the state doesn't do it, the school boards would have the ability to de determine whether or not they want to do it mm -hmm. through their own um, increases that they might um, adjust through property tax increase or something. Mm -hmm. That's where the Republicans are going nuts about, but um, it, it doesn't mean they will or have to. Mm. And it, it means it's a possibility. Well, now, for a while we've had indexing. Well, Is we, that correct? That's, so, what we, that's what the governor was asking for. We've never had in inflationary indexing. Inflationary indexing, and we do not have we, that. We've never had no. it. That, oh, okay. No. And in fact, so like, again, this is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. Um, Governor Walker did a 1,000 year change <laughs> because there was in the 2017 budget, I believe, um, the, a one year moratorium on increases. And he changed that to a 1,000 year moratorium on an increase. So the school districts would have been stuck for a thousand years under that, <laughs> I think. So, and that was in uh, revenue limits. So it goes both ways. Um, and he had 51 total line item vetoes in this budget. Um, the record is set by Tommy Thompson. I think it was 490 one year. Um, and I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, with mm. the things that governors have done over the years. So it's, it just gets a lot of attention when it happens. So the, the governor's staff must spend a lot of time studying that final yeah, version. Yeah, I, I was, uh, yeah. They must have really been <laughs> uh, burning the midnight oil because it, it only took a few days mm -hmm. before he signed that budget with those changes in it. And of course, the other big change was on the um, income tax brackets that the Republicans had created in their budget. And he and the governor vetoed the top two, um, right? I think the top, anyway, he, they wanted to reduce from four brackets to three. And he, he vetoed, uh, line item vetoed out that top one. So that was back to two, back to four. Back to four. And the uh, the one, yeah. So you, you I, yeah, I have to get this right. So there's only one that remained that gets that is going to change their percentage, and that's the low bracket, lowest bracket. So the lowest earners are going to get a bit a better break than others. But everybody's going to get, by the way, everyone gets that break up to thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, no matter what your income is, no matter what bracket you're in, you get that first thirty thousand dollar break that. That, mm -hmm. the, that is in the original budget that Republicans passed. So um, what he, was interesting to note is that as all you're going to hear is the big number 
of the three point some billion dollar tax cut that he reduced to 175 million. The top 11 earners in the whole state of a state of six, almost six million people, the top 11 earners were going to get an average of $1.8 million tax cut. Just those 11 the biggest, people. Uh, biggest. That amounted to almost $2 billion of the whole package. So when they want to tell you that, oh, you know, he, the Governor Evers did this to you, if you're listening and you're not one of those top 11 earners, or if you're not making over a million dollars a year, you're really not, uh, you weren't being affected much anyway. So in fact, the brackets, and I, I, this I have memorized, I've looked at this so many times, the middle, the mid range, which is the average um, income of is between 50 and 60,000, that bracket, or that, that's, that wasn't a bracket, but that um, range would have under the Republicans' plan gotten a $164 decrease in your income tax. And the upper... The uppers the, were, were the, in the, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so I think it, just, and, and I just keep saying, you can't fix your road on your own with $164. You can't even pay childcare for a week worth $164. And, the, and if the Republicans would work with us, we wanted to, of course, put $340 million into child care counts. That's, mm -hmm. so, that if you, so when we work together, we can do things. Mm -hmm. And I mean us as collectively as a whole and put that $164 into these sorts of projects. We can do, fix more roads. We can be sure people can get back to work because so their children are in, in child care. Um, all sorts of things we can do. And unfortunately, we're not working together. Well, initially, I think the gov in the governor's budget, he had proposed uh, the, the biggest um, tax breaks were to go to the middle and lower middle class yeah. wage earners. And um, uh, obviously, that was, that was watered down significantly in the, in well, the Republicans' budget. It was uh, more enhancement of the higher wage earners. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the uh, Republicans are still working on getting to that flat tax scheme that they have, which does not, again, and it, those are examples I just gave, they're getting closer and already, you know, you're not going to get a break um, that's going to really change your life or make a big difference in most people's lives, but it will for the rich and mm -hmm. they, as if they need more. Um, and, and another reminder is that this whole scheme of going from even from four to three or to two brackets or to one. When the uh, income tax was in created in 1911, all the way until 1940, I think, there were 13 brackets. 13 brackets. That's when you. That's what you call progressive taxation. Mm -hmm. So that and, it, and that's not complicated. You, when you know what number you have and uh, earnings. You, you know where to put it, you fit that bracket, and that's what you pay. And you know, and, as, and you know as well as I do that as on a federal level, um, from 1952 to 63 or something like that, or no, 1944 to 63, um, the top earners were paying 90%, not 7.65%, which is what our top earners pay in state income tax now. Well, and, and that represented you didn't pay the 90% until you reached way up here. That's and, right. And so again, so, all those brackets yeah. gave you, and that's where it gets complicated. If you make a lot of mm -hmm. money, you got to split the first 30,000, you pay this amount. And the first next mm -hmm. 30,000, you pay that, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. You know, well, they can afford it because they have bookkeepers, but um, to do that. But you're right. You mm -hmm. don't pay that high end until you reach that high end. Yeah, and I think that maybe that's what confuses a lot of people that that you you on the pr first say thirty thousand, uh, let's say uh, you that's the first bracket we'll say, then you pay x say say you pay two percent, the next thirty percent you might that that portion you pay maybe 
four percent on it, and then it works its way up. Yeah. And so, so, so people who do have large uh, earnings um, are not paying ninety percent on all of it. Only the very highest amount. Yeah. If they reach that highest bracket. That's right. Because obviously, if there were thirteen, that's a long. It was. It took some yeah. earning power to do that. I like telling the story of the early 60s or late 50s. Um, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, was president of AMC, American Motors mm -hmm. Corporation. And they had a great year, and, and the uh, board wanted to give him a raise, which would have moved him just into that 90% bracket for that top earnings. And he, so he turned it down. And he, and he instead generously said, let's put that money back into our workforce. They should earn more money instead of me. If that's, that's a great incentive right there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, why? Because it makes sense. Why should he turn around and have to pay? Take, what, what's the point in getting a raise if 90% of it goes, goes somewhere else? You might as well make sure it goes back into your yeah. workforce. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, you know, if you, someone who has, who's making, say, $50,000 a year, um, every dollar spending power you have is more important to that person than someone who's making 300000 uh, um, if you If you have, the, like in a flat tax, you have the same percentage taken out. It's more detrimental to those who are lower wage earners yeah. because it's cutting... The, the amount they need for their basic uh, uh, life needs, housing yeah. and, and so forth. So yeah. it's, uh, it is, it, it's kind of theoretical and it's, hard to, it's sometimes hard to figure out. But I think one of the items in, in, the, in the budgeting process this year, wasn't there some talk about equalization of, of uh, school? Um, um, uh, equalization in terms of the monies for each student. In the state, was there something in there? So about, that was in the governor's. Yeah, that was in the governor's. governor's yeah, he was trying to that's have long equal. gone, <laughs> but, oh, but okay. uh, you know we had, and I've said it before, I probably have said it here, we had a nearly seven. We do have a nearly seven billion dollar surplus, mm -hmm. and we're squandering it away, and would have squandered half of it away just on the the wealthy um, tax breaks that the Republicans wanted to give away. And instead, what we should be doing and could be doing still is to raise the low spending districts up so that we can equalize that uh, funding for our schools across mm -hmm. the state and then create a actual smart smarter funding formula to begin with so that we don't fall into that trap again that we are in now in where we have low spending districts and high spending districts i'm tired of hearing from my republican colleagues and friends that we can't afford to do to fix that formula because we can't afford to bring those low spending districts up. We can right now. And well, now my, they don't want to talk about it. Well, my understanding is that the state is responsible for education, they public are. education. And, and you, you, you could, in theory, have a district that, that, that uh, is working with $12,000 a year per student and another district that might have $16,000 per student. And so you may you it would be hard to equate those as being equal education opportunities right. yeah they because the formula is based on um well the biggest thing it's based on is property values so the property mm -hmm. values of your of your taxing district mm -hmm. um and if with you're in the lake district you know you're you're out of luck um you're gonna you're not going to get that funding from the state because it's presumed on paper that you don't need as much funding because you're a wealthy district. Well, not necessarily, because usually that also means um, a lot of wealthy people have bought up that property around those lakes and built large homes, and they've raised those values up because their values mm -hmm. are so high, and it looks like you, your whole district is wealthy. Well, I think in this part of the state, we have some of the poorer districts. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Tremplow County, I think, has some of the... Who, and they're not getting uh, uh, more funding to to bring us up. I don't think to equalize value throughout the state. No, it's it's uh, my whole district has got several school districts that uh, mm -hmm. are really struggling, and and uh, it isn't getting any better with what 
what the uh, education funding bill that was recently passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, as I think about it, you know, you, a couple things happen in, in your school districts. I mean, the smaller school districts uh, don't have the students to justify as many course offerings, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, even if you have the additional funds, it may not allow for a whole lot of that. Uh, it's really a struggle. These, these school districts are really in a struggle. And, and I've seen it, in, in, in a, if I may be, speak rather personally, uh, I've seen it with my own family where, where uh, one of our children went on to school and, and could not compete in that, her, her chosen study field yeah. because those who came out of larger districts and wealthier districts had more um, coursework that in, that kind of enhanced their ability to to succeed in in college in those fields, and uh, it makes it tough. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, and we all can't live in those districts. No, you know, and similarly, again, I've said this a lot a lot lately. Childcare. Mm -hmm. If you're if you can't afford childcare, if it's not available to you when you're when brain development is most happening between birth and five years old before you enter school, mm -hmm. wealthy, those with means can afford to have their child prepared for school. Mm -hmm. And people who are in poverty or lesser means are struggle to, to give, them, give their children the opportunities that they need to develop so that they are ready for school. So on that end of the spectrum, they're not ready in the, begin, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're going to a school district where, again, like you just described, may not have the offerings because they can't afford the offerings that, and preparing them for those for the next stage in life after mm -hmm. high school graduation. So it's a huge cycle, isn't it, mm -hmm. of, of uh, not just not even poverty, but sometimes just not having the opportunities that every that others might have. And I think what we fail to talk about is that our future of, of this state is based on uh, well-educated people. And if you, if you don't have well-educated people, if you have a, a group of population, a large group of population that don't have opportunities to develop their skills and, their, and, and so forth, um, everybody's going to suffer in some way, you know? Uh, I, I guess it's simply it's a, a very unfortunate situation. Um, uh, I guess we need to keep talking about it, though. We do. We, you know. we need all the more it comes down to is we need to work together. We need to find a way to get politics out of the way. And I know almost everyone agrees. And I'm tired of saying it and, and being in a position where I, I can't seem to make it happen yet. But mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see something changing here as a, Supreme Court's going to be taking some action on maps and from there um, forcing politicians to have to be more attentive to the voters and to opinions from both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think it was just this morning I was listening to a, a bit of news and, and this particular individual was pointing out that uh, um, voting is so crucial and that yeah. that uh, that uh, there are many people who who have lost interest because they feel things can't change mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they've lose they've uh, run out of patience to see change happen and you and I've talked about that how at times uh, being that you serve in, in a uh, in a very minority situation as, as a Democrat in the, in the uh, Wisconsin Senate how important it is for us to not lose faith and keep and keep getting out there and voting, and and uh, supporting uh, the people who represent your interests. Yeah, you know, Dick, we hear a lot of talk about voter suppression, and there is that. Yes, there there's is. That, there's the um, the conscious effort to mm -hmm. to make it harder for some people to vote, but. One of those that people don't really notice that I, I do is just the idea of planting in people's minds that your vote doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. To me, that's voter suppression or your vote doesn't count or whatever, reason, whatever way they want to say it. 
and discouraging people from even thinking about voting. Oh, it doesn't matter anymore, or it doesn't mm -hmm. matter anyway, or I'm just one of thousands. That, what, what's one vote? It all adds up. And to me, that's just voter suppression. Yeah, and I, I'll point out where voters count. We all have stories. Uh, I ran for the county board here in Trumpelow County one year. I had not planned to, and at the last minute I decided I'd like to stay on the board if possible, so I wrote, ran as a write-in candidate. I won by two votes. Now, if you that, there's, a, there's a lesson in that. Yeah. That every vote does count, and uh, uh, it, it was two votes, and, and the recount, they found the third one. But, <laughs> you know, um, uh, it, we all, it makes so much, uh, it's so important that we all get out there and support, again, candidates yeah. and, 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 and uh, issues that are important to us. And, and I think, and I, I'm going to be very partisan when I say, I think the Democrats have historically, uh, at least since probably the 30s, have have worked hard to to try to assist the masses in this country to prosper and to get education to to have uh, safeguards to fall back on um, and, and we all know many of those programs through our education right you know I and, you know just recently it was a conversation I had with someone it is pretty fascinating to realize where Franklin Roosevelt came from with talk about someone coming from a privileged mm -hmm. life. They had a, plenty. He had more, more than most people in this country ever had. But yet, he's the one who was really developing programs to make sure that nobody got left behind mm -hmm. and had opportunity because he was having to bring us out of a depression. So those programs came from those years. And, and uh, we can't let that... Um, slip away now. We have to make sure that we all hang on to mm -hmm. those opportunities. Yeah, I think we could name many, many programs that came out of that era and since then, you know, uh, that have benefited a lot of people. Um, I don't know how close we're to the end here. Well, I think we have 30 seconds 30 left. seconds? Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you a question about what's happening uh, now that you are, you've made it through the budget phase. Um, but it sounds like you don't have any uh, necessarily any uh, session time coming up or any we, meeting not time? scheduled. But of course, there could be attempts at veto overrides, and they might call us in for that sort of thing. But otherwise, we'll be introducing legislation that we've been holding back on, and, and uh, be, be getting into more detailed work. Okay. Well, I tell you, we hope that you guys can uh, work on many of these other issues as as you uh, move through the year. And thank you for being here today, Jeff. And uh, we'll try to get together next month if it's possible. Yeah, you okay. bet. Thank, thank you, you all.